From the Korea Economic Institute in Washington, D.C., you're listening to Korean Context, news and analysis from the Korean Peninsula. Hello, and welcome to Korean Context. I'm Jenna Gibson, and I'll be your host today. Today we have the second in our back-to-back episodes with contributors to the academic paper series. This week's guest is Brad Glosserman, Executive Director of the Pacific Forum CSIS, who flew all the way from Honolulu to present here at KEI and, of course, to speak with me for the podcast. The topic of his presentation and the forthcoming paper is trilateral relations between the United States, South Korea, and Japan, a topic that has been extremely important in the past, of course, but could become even more interesting and important as we look to a new administration in Seoul and a relatively new administration here in Washington, D.C. So, Brad, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me here today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to Washington, and thanks for giving me the chance to share my thoughts with your podcast audience. So this is kind of my go-to first question for the podcast, as our regular listeners have probably caught on. But can you start off by setting the scene for us? What is the status of trilateral relations between the United States, South Korea, and Japan at the moment? Cloudy. Uh, The the forecast is cloudy with with potential showers, I'm afraid. Trilateralism in this particular uh, discussion is an outgrowth of a book that I did with Scott Snyder, uh, my co-author, who's a senior fellow at uh, Pacific Forum, but is also the Korea chair at the Council on Foreign Relations, and I think one of the smartest people on uh, Korea that I know of. Uh, please don't tell him I said that. He'll just get a swelled head. But um, Scott and I worked on this analysis of national identity and its potential for creating clashes between uh, Japan and South Korea and its implications for the United States and East Asian security. Uh, for many, many years, far too many years. Uh, I think both of us would admit that this has been a testing and difficult uh, project and one that our friendship, amazingly enough, survived, or at least I think it did. I may have to ask Scott about that. Nevertheless, what we decided or, or what our research showed was is that the questions of national identity are coming to the fore in Japan and South Korea in the aftermath of the Cold War, that there are different national political calculuses at work, and, and consequently, these rising phenomenon uh, in consciousness of identity creates real problems for coordination between Japan and Korea, as well as before between Japan, Korea, and the United States to address what are really, really critical national security concerns. We call that, you know, we, meaning the security community, considers that effective trilateralism. And mostly it's a, uh, how is it that the three governments address the challenge posed by, by North Korea? Uh, to a lesser degree, that of China, and in fact, that's a real sticking point, in fact, between the three different governments. So the state of the, the relationship is is that what we've seen is increasing tension, quite frankly, between Tokyo and Seoul, despite efforts, I think, to kind of address some of the thornier sticking points in the relationship, and with very, very mixed successes. And as a result, our capacity of our three governments to work together has been, I think, uh, undercut to an extensive degree. So we've got trilateral defense consultations. We've got trilateral uh, military exercises. We have the general recitation, if you will, of the need for cooperation between Seoul and Tokyo and between the three governments whenever the United States or U.S. senior U.S. officials get together with their counterparts in Tokyo and Seoul. And we've even had a couple of trilateral meetings, typically on the fringes of other multilateral get-togethers. But I think that what we're doing is the minimum uh, that we would hope to do more. And uh, what we have identified in our book are the obstacles to, to additional progress and some suggestions, some quite radical, quite frankly, uh, in, in ways to overcome these problems. So one comment that I found quite interesting in your presentation was that um, you were talking about how the United States played quite a major moderating role in some of the more recent developments in South Korea-Japan relations, such as the Comfort Women Agreement that you've mentioned. But with a new administration in Washington, led by Donald Trump, who specifically called in his campaign for more participation and more compensation from our allies in the Pacific. Do you see the United States' active role in this trilateral relationship changing? Have we seen that so far now that he's in office? You use the word moderating role. I think the word is really mediating role. And the fact is is that part of our book makes the case that the United States' fingerprints are on 
extraordinary number of critical moments in, in East Asian history since the beginning of the 20th century. And I think we need to, as a country, need to acknowledge that for a bunch of different reasons, for our own, primarily for our own benefit, but also because it's capable of setting an example. You've seen the U.S. pushing multilateral engagement in a variety of moments uh, in recent years because we understand that for a whole bunch of different reasons, the nature of the threats, the nature of the resources that we bring to bear against them, that we really need to be more efficient in the way that we address these regional security challenges. We would hope that Japan and South Korea would be working together, given convergence of threat perceptions, given a uh, you know similar sort of situation, given their values, etc. All of this would be uh, ample reason for them to be cooperating. And again, our problem is is that we're not seeing that necessarily, at least not as much as we would hope. And so the U.S. has endeavored to push behind the scenes because it, neither government can afford to be seen as being manipulated by the United States to push them to do what we consider to be in their best interests. So we've worked actively to create opportunities for conversations between top leadership. We've pushed between for a lot more working level meetings uh, throughout the bureaucracy. And the fact is, is that we've been fairly successful with that. Will it continue? Uh, the current administration does not seem to have, certainly has not yet articulated a national security strategy. Its views of Asia strategically, its views of alliances, and it's, uh, it's thinking about North Korea and the Korean Peninsula. Now, obviously, we've been addressing these problems, but again, there isn't the vision nor, nor the, the, the broader framework within which to put all these pieces. And as a result, I think that, that uh, you don't have, if you will, the larger intellectual concept or, or construct within which actors can engage. Then, of course, there's the question of whether or not the president himself is committed to this. And frankly, he doesn't. He seems somewhat disdainful of multilateralism. Prefers to think in terms of a transactional, bilateral approach, and so that would cut against the grain historically, and would suggest, if we're right in our assumptions that the U.S. needs to play a larger role, it's going to be difficult. Um, so your presentation and also your book that you and Scott wrote uh, use the term national identity and ask the question of how national identity in these three countries affects their foreign policy and trilateral relations. So how does national identity come into play, and what does this term mean for you in, in the realm of foreign policy? There's a couple of ways to address it. One, of course, is the academicians. And within you know the academy, national identity is actually considered a, a broad term that means almost whatever one person wants to call it. We take an analytical, eclectic approach to, to borrow the vernacular. And um, you know our argument basically is, is that we've tried through process of, you know, extensive careers working with, in these countries, looking at the opinion data, uh, doing interviews, looking, reading the literature, trying to, for us, what are the components, you know, uh, that allow, that, that shape how people in these countries think about themselves. And the way that we began the conversation was, and it's really quite fascinating, we did a series of interviews in Japan and in Korea, and we went to Korea first, and we said, what are the key components of, of South Korean national identity? It was very simple. And they said, well, we are a successful democracy. We're an successful market economy. And we are, among other things, a shrimp among whales. We are highly successful in all in many of the things that we've done. We are a divided country and, at the same time, extremely vulnerable. Those core components basically were just bang, 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 came out of every Korean who you asked. You went to the Japanese and we asked the same questions, like, how do you define what it means to be Japanese? And they just didn't get it. They didn't really didn't grok the question. So finally, we got to the stage of like, okay, if how do you think other people see Japanese? That was a question that they could answer. And, you know, what we found out there is a country that sees itself as as small, as isolated, uh, weirdly enough, as vulnerable, uh, a, a country that, that also sees itself, quite frankly, as a victim uh, historically, that it has never quite gotten the status and the recognition that it deserves. And so it's, it's, it's a interesting and I think complex uh, um, sense of, of who the Japanese think they are. And, of course, it can be contested depending not only upon who you're talking to, but who they're, who they are talking to and who they think their audience is. So that was, you know, this notion then of, of who we are. And for the, the Koreans, for example, you know, what you end up with is, is, is a identity of a, of a country that is always on the receiving end of, or the dynamic in regard to larger forces, a country that's not very much in control of its own destiny, which is the shrimp among whales piece. So what does that mean? That means that in the context of its relationship with Japan, rather than focusing on the common threat perception that they have, as they look at North Korea and see it, and they're both inclined to say, this is a country that is a danger to our continued national survival. Instead, the Koreans are inclined to look at it around the region and say, well, you know, we are a country that has been 
invaded and colonized by Japan, and that that uh, we have been divided by Japan, uh, that we are a country that has been exploited by Japan, that we have continuing territorial disputes with the Japanese, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have the historical remnant of the comfort women experience, the, the trauma of that, and that that notion of who we are defines our relationship with Japan, and that is more important, really, in many ways, than the natural, the shared threat that we have or that we face from North Korea and the shared values that we have as democracies, market economies, et cetera, allies of the United States, that that component of our identity takes precedence over these other security considerations. So adding in the third piece there, the United States piece back in, so how does the United States deal with something that is that intrinsic? to an identity. Well, that's, and that's the tricky bit. I mean, number one, what we try to do is we, we make the case that the way you change national narratives is through leadership and that what you have to have is a truly, you know, authentic leader, not just a, a, a government official or a government, the head of government, but someone who leads in the sense of captures the zeitgeist, is capable then of communicating with the people about ways to create or reframe a national narrative. And, you know, in some ways we saw Prime Minister Abe, who is a conservative, would be someone who, in fact, could make the bold gesture and could do it in a way that would be credible to the to not only to the people that he's speaking for, but to the people he's speaking to. By that, I mean, it's the, you know, it's the famous Nixon to China moment, that Richard Nixon could make the bold outreach to the Chinese because he was protected on his right flank. Well, similarly, Prime Minister Abe could reach out and try to reconcile with South Korea in ways that a progressive wouldn't because he would be protected on that conservative flank. And similarly, we would hope that a South Korean leader would be able to reciprocate. Um, President Park tried to, I think, somewhat reluctantly. Uh, and, of course, she's the validity of that particular effort has now been undercut by the political problems that she's faced. And, in fact, the degree of reconciliation that she was able to affect with the Japanese is now subject to challenge precisely because it's her political legacy. And so we have a, there's a real issue there. But the bottom line, to go back to your question, is we need political leaders that are see themselves as leaders and are prepared to make bold statements and bold gestures uh, to their counterparts in other countries. And we're not seeing that. The U.S. role becomes, I think, one of providing, if you will, all the work that's invisible out of the scenes, providing the opportunities for the conversations. Number two, providing the context in the, to these leaders to suggest that why it's a good move for them if they can't see it. You know, and, and obviously they, they're smart people, so they, should, they shouldn't need too much of the United States to convince them of the utility of that. And then third, and I think most instrumentally, the United States has got to be providing an example. And so for, we applauded um, you know, the visit of, of Mr. Ob uh, President Obama to Hiroshima because it was, in my mind, and, and, and Scott's as well, I think a bold step to reframe the narrative about what transpired at the end of World War II. And it was a statement by the United States of taking responsibility for an extraordinary event that I think had horrific consequences um, and hopefully would be setting an example for other leaders. And I think to some degree, to the, the sense that Mr. Abe then visited Pearl Harbor, I think is, is one way of him validating our judgment about the United States leading. Now, what we haven't seen, of course, is the reciprocal gesture, I think, vis-a-vis -vis South Korea or from a South Korean leader, but we're waiting. So we're talking about trilateral relations, but of course, these three countries and their relationships do not exist in a vacuum. Um, especially when Seoul-Tokyo relations were particularly bad, there was a lot of concern about Seoul-Beijing relations. Right. And there were concerns that this tension between South Korea and Japan could push South Korea towards China. Now, you know, to the extent that that may or may not be true, um, we've seen a big shift uh, in South Korea-China relations because of the THAAD um, situation and the Chinese economic retaliations because of that. So is this reversal now going to push Korea back towards the alliance if it was ever pushed away to begin with? And more generally, what is Beijing's role in this trilateral partnership? There is a concern, I think, in the United States and in Japan, and perhaps even more in Japan because of a sense of vulnerability on the part of the Japanese, that Seoul is looking for alternative options and alternative routes to uh, accomplish, you know, the, 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 the broader objectives of prosperity and stability. And quite frankly, what you see in, and, and China plays a, a vital role in that. It's, it's assumption of, you know, Korea's major trading partner. Uh, the proximity question, the perceived leverage that Beijing has with Pyongyang, 
all give Seoul a reason to reassess its relationship with Beijing. And that's a process, quite frankly, that's going on throughout all of East Asia. There is this bifurcation of the security and the economic dimensions of relations. And countries that have all relied on the United States for their security are finding that China is no longer prepared to acquiesce to that relationship. You know, for many, many years, it was fine. We'll trade with you and you can still get your security from the U.S. Increasingly, Beijing is not happy with that arrangement. And so the question then becomes is how is the, how are those partners of the U.S. prepared to triangulate and where are they going to go on the spectrum as they, they strike their balance? And Seoul has argued, um, I think persuasively in my mind, uh, to those of us that were prepared to listen, that the outreach to, 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 to China was tactical, that it did not represent some grand shift in the strategic orientation of the South Korean government or the South Korean people. And, and in fact, I think the argument that they made, or, 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 and the proof was the, the acknowledgement that the only reason that South Korea is, is taken seriously by China, and this is, um, this is a verbatim quote, is because they're standing on the, on the, the shoulders of the alliance. And that in the absence of the alliance, it's, that China would just, you know, not take South Korea terribly seriously. And there's a lot of truth to that. And I think, in fact, the economic controversy that's followed the THAAD deployment is very much, a, I think, an indication of precisely how China feels about its relationships with other countries. And that is, they're big countries and small countries, and China's a big country, and that's a fact. And so what we've seen then is the recognition that China is not the be-all, end-all into many of these problems, that it cannot deliver North Korea on the terms that South Korea would seek, that um, at the same time, China's relationship with South Korea can be every bit as bullying, as overweening, and, and overbearing as the complaints that are leveled against the United States. And that, of course, then raises other questions about the nature of the relationship more generally, and thus the degree to which Seoul can count on China if the, the relationship between Korea and Japan were to be to sour. Um, all of that, I think, raises valid questions on the part of the South Koreans about the nature, how they choose to triangulate between Washington and Beijing, quite frankly. As a kind of final uh, thoughts, given that we have a relatively new president here in D.C. and a new administration in Seoul as well, um, and although Japan doesn't have a new government, um, bringing in Abe as well, do you have any recommendations for these three countries or for these three administrations on how to tackle trilateral relations, especially with a new with these new administrations coming in? Sure. I mean, the first thing that you do is buy my book. Uh, my book with Scott, uh, the Japan. South Korea Identity Clash, Columbia University Press, paperback editions just out. The logic that animated our work is still applicable. I think that the choices that need to be made between for for all the three leaders are to what degree do they wish to be seen, and particularly true for the South Korean and the Japanese leaders, do they want to be seen not only as national leaders but as historical figures? And creating and forging reconciliation an enduring reconciliation is genuine, is, is real leadership. And there is, it's hard. And it, it will require the leadership in both countries to fight the established national narrative, which means courting unpopularity. Uh, no leader likes to do that. I think in the United States that our leader is particularly troubled by this notion of doing unpopular things. Um, but it also requires, I think, a sensitivity to nuance and a, um, a readiness to take what is ultimately moral action. And at this moment, I don't see that as a driver of behavior in the White House. I think Abe strategically is prepared to make those choices if he has a partner. Uh, so I would say the best thing we do is we get, we continue to get the, the impetus for trilateral uh, cooperation at the working levels and from you know, the vice president, the secretaries of state and defense, as we have in the past, the foreign ministers, et cetera, to keep prodding the bureaucracies to do their work. But um, bold gestures are going to be hard, and I think uh, probably it's unreasonable to expect anything like that for some time. Okay, well, like I said, we've covered a lot of ground here today, so I, I really appreciate your time and for answering all my questions. Thanks for having me.